So, uh, hello, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Noam. Uh, I've been working with C++ for some 20 years now. And for the last couple of years, I've been using uh, Google Test and Google Mock to write uh, unit tests on our system. And I thought I'd give a, a brief introduction to, to these libraries. I would say, uh, historically, those were two different uh, libraries. Over the years, they have started to merge more closely together. They're still a little bit separate, and we'll see why uh, during this talk. Uh, so just a, a brief overview. So not surprisingly, developed by Google. Uh, the current version I'm going to talk about is 1.12.1. Uh, it requires C++11, but uh, it will soon uh, be uh, promoting itself to C++14. And there's actually uh, a very good documentation, both in the GitHub and uh, Google provided a, ve a very extensive user guide and a primer, which is a sort of a start here document. And the, the question is, if I believe there is such a good documentation, why am I standing here talking to you all? And the answer is, uh, despite the good uh, documentation and despite the fact that there's a lot of information on Stack Overflow, what I found when people start to work with the, with the library, the difficult thing is to separate what's important, what do you need to know right from the start, versus what can you wait until later and, and progress as you go along, because the documentation is very extensive and it doesn't always separate this is what you need right now, this is what you will need a little bit later. So I'm hoping to work with you step by step and really get a sense of that by the end of this talk, you will be able to feel comfortable working with this library. So what we're going to talk about and what we're not going to talk about. We're not really going to talk about testability. That means how to design your code uh, so that it will be easy to write tests and, how, and, how, and which tests do you want to write. We're not going to talk a lot about how to combine all these tests into your CI CD process. And we're not going to dive very deep into the internals of the library, how it does what it does. Beyond the things that will naturally rise up as we discuss what the library does, what we are going to focus about is actually using it, actually writing tests. So uh, the best way to start coding is to just start coding. And so I, I have a Godbot link here, which will lead us here. So um, as you can see, uh, the first thing you need to do is to include the header files. The header file that you need for a Google test is uh, gtestdigest.h. Uh, there is a, in Godbolt you can, uh, has support for Google tests, so you can just select that library. And uh, start write, reading the code should be fairly simple. We have a, a macro called test, which defines, um, uh, which takes two arguments. One is called a suit, and one is, called, and one is the test name. So, I have, uh, if you look at the first test, I check some, uh, I have a suite of tests called integers. I'm going to check some things about integers. Uh, the first things I'm going to check is that zero actually equals zero. Not surprisingly, that should, that should work. Then I'm going to check if zero equals one. That should not work. And then I'm going to uh, use uh, a variable and check that the variable actually gets the value that I expect it to get, which, is a, which starts to feel a little bit more real life code. And then I have another test, also from the suite of tests called integers, where I check that adding numbers does what I, what I think it does. And then I have uh, the, last, uh, the last test that doesn't belong to integers, belong to strings. I'm going to check some things about strings. That when I initialize a string, it by default is an empty string. I don't know why I want to check that, but I do. 
one comment regarding uh, the main function here. In actual code, uh, you're probably not going to have to write this. Why not? gtest actually has two, uh, if you download and compile it, there's actually two libraries, two shared objects. One of them is gtest, which gives you uh, all the code that you need to, uh, to run gtest, and one is gtest main, which includes the main function. So the main function comes from a shared object uh, from a library that you link. It's a bit odd, but it works and it's very convenient because you don't have to write this uh, main function for yourself all the time. I'm going to write it here because uh, Godbolt by default com uh, links with gmock and not gmock main. Okay, so that's one comment. The thing that we want to start looking at is what's the output? I actually write a program, what does it do? So, first of all, I can say I have three tests from two test suites. So the test suites right now don't mean very much for me. They're just a way to logically uh, separate my tests into logical components. We will see how it becomes more important later on. And I have uh, for each test uh, a name that lets me know what exactly am I going to do to check in this test. And I get uh, so this printout that says uh, this test failed, this test uh, succeeded. Um, yeah, so and, and I have uh, and I get a printout that says uh, you expected a, which is two, to be equal to three, and that's not true. Um, and so on and so forth, and I get this nice summary in, in the end. I said. Uh, I had, again, three tests from two test suites. One test uh, passed, two uh, failed, and I get a list of tests. These are the test of tests that failed. And right after the go, just with that, you can actually do quite a lot. Um, one uh, thing that I want to mention here is that the printout that you get just from using the macro uh, except uh, expect the X uh, gives you a pretty good printout if you want but you can always and this is true and I'm not going to repeat it over and over again every uh, assertion uh, that you do you can also add a printout of your own to further explain why this uh, test was done in the first place so uh, I could have just said I want to compare those two things because so and so and so why is that important? Because the main use, one of the main uses of unit tests is that when future you or somebody else you know, in a, uh, will try to change the code, the unit test will catch them that they're doing a change of behavior. And so it's important to sometimes to document why did you want this behavior to succeed. Okay, so to recap, tests are divided into suites, uh, and we can have what I just called an assertion, which is uh, the exact uh, equ equ equal there, uh, and I can run a few assertions in any tests. So, so far, so good. I collect tests into suites. Right now, for my uh, convenience, and uh, a test is, uh, at the end of the day, a, a collection of assertions, certain things that I expect to happen, to be, to be true. So, what kind of assertions uh, can I have? Well, the main ones that uh, you're going to use in practice are expect equal and uh, expect to and expect false, which are special cases of expect equal. The second uh, most common would probably be expect not equal. Usually uh, you want to compare something that is not null, so that uh, a process succeeded and uh, return a valid object in some sense. There are others. 
that you would expect x, uh, so expect that something is le less than, less equal, greater than. Uh, there are also uh, floating point uh, equalizers. It's important to use the float point equalizer, not the actual uh, equal, because uh, floating points have uh, notoriously issues with rounding, e uh, rounding errors, and the expect float knows how to handle that and gives you doesn't check that they are literally equal, they check they're equal up to a minor uh, fraction. So uh, use those. Uh, you can expect uh, a lot of information about throwing. If your uh, function throws an exception, you can uh, check that it throws, it ch you can check that it doesn't throw. And of course, you can expect death. And this has just become a lot uh, darker quite uh, fast. Uh, but you can check that uh, uh, if your uh, function asserts or terminates in any way, there are ways you can check that. And you can check that you, for example, assert and output you know, the correct error message or whatever uh, it is that you want to do on termination. So there's a lot of things that you can check. Uh, but as I said, mostly you want to expect that mostly what you assert is that an operation that you called for has generated the output that you expected it to call. So um, one thing you should be aware of, and that is something that uh, tricks a lot of uh, programmers who are not so cautious the first time they are using it, C-strings. If a function returns a C-string, and you compare it like I did in the first line to a simple string, then what you're actually comparing are the pointers, not the content. So this, if foo actually uh, allocates a string and return uh, str inside a string that it allocated, this will not, the first line will actually, won't actually check that. We'll check that the pointer is the same pointer. Could be useful, but not what you usually want to. My suggestion is that you actually promote uh, the string to be a std string, which will cause the equalization to promote the output of foo also to std string. And then you compare std strings, and everything uh, is what you expect it to be. You can also uh, use uh, expect str equal, which uh, check things uh, as well. I don't recommend it. it. It's actually less clear in the code when you write it like that. The reason I do mention it is because uh, it has a version that is case insensitive, which is nice. So uh, what happens when, so this is great for uh, you know, strings and uh, integers and all the things that uh, we are used to work with the uh, C++, but we also will definitely want to check our own types, our own structures that we defined. So uh, let's look at an example of that. What, the, what, what was required of us in order to do that? So again, I've got, uh, got my link uh, ready. So uh, I defined a, a small struct uh, called point, and uh, I'm running a very simple test here below uh, which uh, I test if two points are the same. Um, and what do I get? I get an error. I get an error because I don't know how to, uh, how to compare points, obviously. It's just a structure that I just defined. But if I'll uh, define the, oops, the equal operator with the operator overloading, then the moment this will uh, now everything compiles and it looks fine and it works, it works. The thing that I don't like, and it's okay, you can work with this, but I don't like it, is that uh, what it tells you is that an eight-byte object is not identical to an eight-byte object, which is true, but doesn't help me very much. Um, it's even worse if one of those bytes would actually be a pointer that I want to check. And then, obviously, it's not the same, but that doesn't mean anything. What do, what do I need to do in order to uh, get rid of that? 
I need to define uh, how to how to print out to uh, to our stream um, the class I've uh, the structure sorry uh, that I just defined, and once I enable that, then okay, now I see a point A which is x uh, equals one and y equals two um, is different from B which is x equals zero and y equals one. Okay, that's understandable. Now I can understand it. I don't have to technically define this uh, printout operation, but do future do future selves uh, a favor and do that. It will make life a lot easier when you get uh, when you get to that. So, back to the slides. So, what do we learn? Uh, assertion will work with operator overloading. What operator do you need to to overload? Depend on which assertion you are going to actually use. Typically, it would be, like I said, the equal operator. Uh, and there's a great benefit to uh, defining this pretty print. Otherwise, when you make changes to the code and the uh, tests will start to fail, it will be a lot harder to understand why do they fail. OK. Let's talk about fixtures a little bit to remind us. Uh, tests are divided into suites. And up till now, I said that the reason for suites is to logically divide the tests into groups. It makes sense to divide the tests into groups so I can understand, OK, this is one subject, this is another subject. This is true. But uh, there is another be added benefit when we start to use fixtures. So let me just, uh, again, switch to, uh, to, uh, to the code and say, OK, First of all, what is, what is a fixture? A fixture is basically a class or struct that inherits from a testing test. And what, is the, what it allows me to do is to create a, a shared a code and a shared functionality that will be relevant to all the tests I will run in a certain suite. So uh, if I have a suit, or if I have a, fact, uh, a structure called a demo fixture, I can have several tests. Notice that I do need to use test underscore f instead of just test, because I need to mark that this is a fixture test. And the name of the suit is the name of the fixture. So that's how we know to, to connect the two. And I can use in the test uh, to check that i, which I defined in the, in the fixture, start at 17, and then I can call a function that, again, I've defined in the fixture and see that i have turned into 18. And when I do the next test, i has been reset. It will be resetted every time for every test. Why is it, Im why is it important? Because it allows us to avoid using globals, and it allows us to avoid doing anything that will cause one test to impact another test. It means that everything is being resetted, every single test that we do. OK? So uh, again, so it allows us to reuse code and uh, variables across tests. We do so by inheriting from testing test. And we need to use test f uh, instead of test. The stages that, we, uh, that happen when we, when we run a test using a fixture are as follows, and this is important to understand. First, we have the default constructor happening, so we create a new instance of the fixture. Then there is a function that is, uh, that is called, and you can override it, uh, called setup, which allows you to do further setups. Then whatever you wrote in the <coughs> test body takes place. And afterwards, the, another function called teardown, and at the end, the destructor. Best practice, uh, both from Google and I also recommend from personal experience, avoid using setup and teardown. Use everything, the constructor and the destructor. Why do you need uh, setup and teardowns? Well, there are cases. For example, if the teardown might throw an exception, then you don't want to do that in the destructor. If, uh, so th there are a few cases in which this has happened, but generally, and after write writing 
hundreds of tests, I never needed to use setup and teardown. So it's there if you need it, but generally avoid it. If you need the reference uh, complex objects, not just you know plain with okay. setup looks like a proper place when when you prepare your reference object to compare with. Otherwise, where do you compare the output of your set? So yeah, I didn't quite understand. Let's say you want to have a complex objects returned by the function you are testing. Okay. And you want to compare them with the reference object. Okay. So you, where do you prepare this reference object before running the test? Like you set up the, the place to do that. Uh, why not do this in the different constructor? So, uh, so uh, why did you uh, recommend not to use setups? Let's why not? To, and why not? To recom why not recommend the uh, setups? Yeah. Uh, okay, there are a couple of reasons. Um, reason number one is that if you have a fixture that inherits from a fixture, then the default constructors will always be called all the way up, but the setups of the, your uh, derived of your base uh, fixture will not be called. It is a virtual function. That's why it won't be called. Only the instance of the law of the so again, you have a you have a best fixture and a derived uh, fixture. Only the setup of the derived fixture would be called, not the not the not the setups of the uh, base. Yeah, you can you call it explicitly. Probably. You can call it explicitly. Yes, um, setup doesn't allow you to set const elements in your fixture because they are const. Uh, there, are, there are benefits to setup. I just wanted to say, if you want to, uh, we'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but if you want to put uh, some sort of a cert which returns void uh, statement in your, in your preparation, then you need to use setup because uh, the assert uh, returns void and constructor can't, you can't put a return void in the, uh, in the constructor. So that would be, for example, a case why you do need to use setup. So there are cases, but the general indicate, but generally prefer to use a constructor and a destructor instead of a setup and tear down. Okay, so th this was a very good uh, se uh, setup. I <laughs> just got to the right slide. So uh, I want uh, expect uh, something, expect equal, expect uh, true, expect uh, and, uh, and otherwise. And there are also assert versions to all of those things. So assert equal uh, and uh, assert true and everything else. Generally, prefer to use expect rather than assert. But it's important to understand uh, the difference. Expect is just a regular statement, like assignment to a variable. You can write it pretty much anywhere that you want. And um, preferably put it in the test body because uh, you will see the line number which if the expectation will fail you'll see the line number and the line number in the test body would be more indicative than if it's somewhere else that is more generic and be called from any place that you want and it doesn't stop the test technically if, uh, if, an expect if that sort of assertion fails it continues will check the, re the rest of the test assert on the other hand hides a return statement within it which is why we can't put it in the constructor, for example. Uh, it can be placed only in functions that return void. If you place it in a function that does not return void, then the return statement is incorrect, and you will get a compilation error, which is not very clear. Uh, again, the best practice is to place it in the test itself, and since it hides a return, once the uh, assertion fail on a cert uh, equal for, uh, for the discussion, then the test will stop. Why it's important, if for example, uh, you expect a, a function to allocate an object with certain properties, and it fails to even allocate it, then trying to dereference it later on to, to expect the value would probably crush the system, or crush the test, which would be less indicative if you stop it in an orderly fashion. That being said, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning. 
prefer to use exp expect something rather than assert something. OK. Surprisingly, this is most of uh, Google tests itself. Uh, there are other kinds of uh, setups we can do, for example, parameterized uh, tests and all that. They're actually less useful than you might think. Um, so before going to a Google mock, does anybody have any questions on the syntax so far? Excellent. OK, so let's talk about mocking a little bit. Um, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And what's the solution? So Google tests will work well and will serve you very well. But on real code, you usually, your code probably need to use other code to run. Probably makes calls and references to other pieces of code. The question is, when you do a test, do you want to actually call that code and rely on it to also provide you the answer that you expect it to, to do? Or do you want to do something else? That is actually a very big question and it, re and it relates to what is defined as a unit within your system. And there are some cases which you obviously have to uh, not use the actual uh, code that you will use in production. For example, if it's a customer uh, database, you don't want that your test to actually set anything in, on the database. If, for example, you are uh, sending logs and you want to make sure that the log has the right time in the log, then if you actually use the system time as you do in production, you will keep getting uh, different times. So there are cases where you have to uh, use, uh, uh, use mocking. Um, there are cases where it's, it depends. You can uh, make arguments either here or there. Um, the solution in case you have decided that you don't want to actually rely on a different piece of code is to create a, a simplified object that will let you define what the behavior that you want to, uh, to occur and to use dependency injection to pass that uh, object instead of uh, the object that you will use in production. So right here, there's the big difference on why Google test was separated originally from Google mock. Because Google test, so far, I did not make anything, did not say anything about how you write your code. Write your code any way you like. There's a function, you call a function, and I can just compare the, the results. Right here, when I start to, to talk about Google Mock, I'm starting to, to say things about how you design your, uh, uh, your, your program, your, your application. Use dependency injection. By the way, there are ways to work around that. But the default uh, and expected uh, behavior of users of GMOC is to use a uh, dependency injection. What that means, how does this work? Uh, again, I have a link because code is better uh, explained. So first of all, I needed to add a GMOC, uh, a GTS GMOC, as a, oh, sorry, GMOC, uh, GMOC.h as an additional uh, h5. And what usually happens is that I have a, a, a class or a struct or some sort of object, and it will inherit from a, a base interface class. So there will be some a class that uh, will have virtual functions, and my code will get a pointer to that base class, and will, you, and will invoke the uh, virtual functions to that base class. And if instead of actually providing uh, uh, the real implementation, I'll provide a, a reference to an object that is my mock, then the code will use my mock instead. Okay, so a bit in the air. Uh, everybody's with me. Okay, excellent. So uh, I have this uh, uh, this uh, object that I'm going to use to mock, and. Right now, for this example, I did not actually inherit from an interface, but OK, that's not a problem. And uh, I defined uh, two methods on this uh, class, and I used a, a, a macros to do that. So uh, the uh, macro to, to use to define method is mock method. 
it gets three or four uh, parameters. Uh, the first one is the return value, the second one is the method name, the third one is uh, the list of uh, arguments that the method will take, and the fourth one is uh, modifiers on the method. The most important ones are cost and uh, no throw, and uh, you can also use uh, override if you want. Uh, there are four or five of them. Const uh, is probably the most important one. Um, Okay, so this defines uh, my mock object. So now I have a, uh, an object that implements the interface that my system will use, and I've implemented uh, uh, the methods of that interface, supposedly. How do I set uh, my expectations? What do I expect will happen in my test? Well, uh, I expect uh, the object will be called. So I have a macro called expect called. And I expect, uh, I defined in my uh, fixture, a mock object. And I expect that mock, that mock object will be called with a function foo once it should uh, return the number six and once it should return the number nine. Okay, so far uh, should be fairly clear. Notice the usage of fixture. So I have one mock object for every test. And it's going to be reset, and my, the expectations of on it are going to be reset every test. And we'll see in a moment why this is important. So I have three tests here. One is I uh, call foo once and expect to get a number uh, six. Once is I call foo twice, expecting to get six and nine. And once I'm going to call it uh, three times, expect to get six, nine, and zero. Uh, as far as the tests go, the first one fails, the second one succeeds, the third one fails, but, the, but they all fail, both the first and the, the third, on the fact that the expectations were not met. This one is unsatisfied, this is, uh, and here it was called more than expected. Can I call one test from another? No. No, uh, what, what, uh, what I would suggest to do in, the, in such a case is to write uh, uh, in your fixture the logic that you want to test, and then you can call it from both tests and uh, extend it uh, in case you want to. Excuse me? Yes. What happens if I want to call a tested function that calls another function internally, and then I want to mark the, the internal function that it calls? I don't care about that result. I want to know that it Um, yes, there are subtleties in, in this. Um, generally, the answer is yes. The, 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 the thing to remember is that um, it, it, it always depends on how you design your uh, dependency injection, basically. That, 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 that's the real answer. If you uh, inject the right thing, then you can set the expectation on it. If you, uh, if that internal function that, that is being called comes from uh, an injected object, then you can set uh, expectation on it, and it doesn't matter if it's, what, if it's called internally or externally. Did I answer the question? Okay, so, so the, the thing to remember is that at the end, what we're aiming for is to have an interface that is being invoked in some fashion. We don't care how it's invoked. And we can set the expectations on those invocations. So the important thing is to make the interface uh, well enough so uh, uh, we can make, we can make, we can, every interface it's sort of a, borderline between units. So if you want to set an expectation in one place and not in another, you need to have a borderline or an interface on that place. So maybe that's a better way to, to, to answer the question. Uh, okay, so, uh, 
So I can see that in the first test it fails because uh, the, the foo wasn't called enough, and in the second test it, it failed because it foo uh, called more times than expected. Notice that the expect equal didn't fail. I only defined two expectations, and I call it three times, it still works. Um, how did it know that in the first test that uh, foo wasn't called enough times? How does it know it won't be called again in, in, uh, in a few seconds? Because the, evalu the evaluation of the which expectations were met or not met is done on the destructor of the mock object. So that's why it's important that the mock object get destroyed every test. So we know that all of the expectations for the test were met or not met. So mock objects really should belong in a fixture that gets reset every test. OK. So uh, as I said, uh, we have a mock method. It, uh, it takes uh, those four parameters. And expect call uh, is used to define what will happen. We saw a uh, will once uh, operation. There's also a uh, will repeatedly, which means we don't care how many times it will call. Every time, do the same thing. So what, uh, what happens when, uh, what, what can we put inside the uh, will once? Uh, OK, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, uninteresting calls. So I defined two, uh, two methods on my mock object, foo and bal. I don't know if you remember. And I defined expectations on what foo will, uh, would, will happen when it foo will be called. What happens when bal is called? I did not set any expectations on bal. So one, one way you could have thought about it would be, if I didn't set any expectations, that, that means I expect it not to be called. That's not uh, the way uh, Google Mock behaves. Google has called this an uninteresting call. You didn't say anything, else, anything about it. It's not interesting. What's the behavior for an uninteresting call? Depends. By default, if we define it uh, uh, as I define it in, in this test as a mock type object, it's what is called as nagging. It means it will output a warning to the, uh, uh, for the test, but it will not fail. Sorry? That's the nagging mock. The nice mock, which is the, the one after that, uh, will just assume that uninteresting calls are allowed and will let it pass with, an with one exception I'll, I'll state in a moment. The, uh, the last option is to be a strict mock, which says uninteresting, in uninteresting uh, calls are errors. If you really don't care uh, what this, uh, uh, what this uh, uh, method does, expect it to uh, put an expectation that it will rep uh, uh, repeatedly return some value that you don't care about. But don't leave, don't leave it undefined. If it's undefined and it's still be called, that's a problem. Now I'm going to back away from Google's recommendations. Google recommendations is to use nice mock. The reason Google gives to, uh, to support nice mock is that it makes your tests more resilient. Not every small change will affect, uh, particularly changes in uninteresting calls, will not affect a, the te if the test passed or not passed. I recommend you use strict mock because from personal painful experience, those are interesting calls hide bugs. So uh, despite the fact that it causes a lot of extra work to define those things, I recommend using the strict mock. Whatever you do, don't leave the nagging one. That's, uh, des decide what your policy is regarding uninteresting calls. Either you allow it or you don't allow it. By the way, even if you have a nice mock and you supposedly allow everything, you might still need to, uh, to define uh, the return value. Why? If, you, if an uninteresting call happens and it needs to return an object, it needs to create that object. And if that object does not have a default constructor, then there is no way uh, for the system to actually uh, return the object. And what will happen if you call that function without setting, uh, without defining the return value is that an exception will be thrown and the, 
test will uh, stop and fail at that point. So just be aware of that. So what actions can we put inside, uh, inside will once or will, uh, will repeatedly? Well, uh, we can put return if it is a function that uh, returns void, just return. It's useful in some cases. We can return obviously a, a value. Uh, we return uh, what is being pointed to by an element. Why is that important? Say that I want to uh, call a function and uh, call foo and that make foo return every time an increased number. So I want it to return 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If I will set return uh, something like return i++, it will not work. Why it won't work? Because the evaluation of the return is done when I declare the, uh, declare the expectation. Not, every t not on every invocation. So, it w so the value of value will be calculated once and will be returned constantly. If I want to return a value that will be changed during the, uh, 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 during the, uh, between different invocations, I can use return point e, in which every time will be returned the value that PTR points to, and I can change that outside of the uh, of the expectation or as we'll see in a moment I can also change it within the uh, within the uh, within the invocation of the function so those are the basic uh, return types there are others there are more actions um, but there are more there are more side effects that you can do for example you can take a, an argument that was passed to your function and save it so you can test it later on or use it in some other way. And uh, there are, there's a long list of uh, possible uh, actions that you can do. Um, for, brief, uh, for this talk, I'm going to just mention invoke, which is uh, the Swiss army knife uh, of actions. Basically, it takes uh, any callable that takes the same argument uh, that the function gets pass all the arguments to that callable and return the action. So you can do anything you want with invoke. Um, I still recommend, if possible, to use the uh, specific actions because it will make the code more readable and more maintainable. But invoke will do whatever you want. And if you want to do more than one action, you can just tell uh, uh, Google Mock to do all and give it a list of actions and it will do all the actions. Okay, so let's talk about distinguishing between calls. So all the invocations of foo are basically the same because foo doesn't get any arguments. So there's no way to distinguish between the first, between one invocation of foo and the other. They, they look the same. Unless it has a state. Uh, it does. Some static or no, foo doesn't use a static, it's a mock function. It's a mock function. We, def we define the, the implementation of uh, what foo will do. You see, you're saying you, I should not have a state. No, I'm saying you can't. Because foo is a mock function. You do, you do not write it. The macro that we use, that mock my method, actually uh, implemented foo. The call to the interface can be distinguished because we don't know what's behind the, the, the implementation. doesn't matter because we're calling the interface. And the calls to the interface cannot be distinguished because there are no parameters to help us distinguish between, uh, the, between different calls. That is not true for bar. Bar doesn't get uh, one parameter, which is an integer in, my, in our example. So we can distinguish it by the argument. So if bar is called with the number one or if bar is called with the number two, we can say, OK, this is one thing and this is the other. Um, how can we do that? Well, uh, we have a thing that, call, that is called matches uh, that allows us to, uh, to match different calls and distinguish between them. And again, I think this is the last one. Yes. OK. So uh, now I've uh, set, uh, set up expectations. And I said a uh, bar would be called with the, uh, any number of times with the variable one, and every time I'm going to return the number two. 
and it's going to be called with the number two, and every time that's happened, I'm going to return the number five. And a few things. If I don't make any calls, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll repeatedly does not, doesn't uh, mandate any specific number of calls. So if I don't call it at all, it's fine. If I'm going to call bar with one or two, basically with any sequence of call repeatedly, not repeatedly, everything will be fine. What happens if I call bar with a number that I did not expect, like three? Is that an uninteresting call or is it uh, a violation? The answer is it's a violation. Once I set up expectation for this function, I have to match it every time. So notice that. The, the, it's, it's a slight distinction that's very confusing. For people, what counts as, a, as an interesting and uninteresting uh, uh, call, once you set any expectation on a method, any call is interesting. How come it is not marked in red on line 36? Sorry? It is not marked in red on line 36 for some reason, even, even though it fails. Oh. Um, it's a compile export thing, I think. It, it, first of all, yes, it's a compile export thing. Uh, but more importantly, notice that it says it tries to match the expectations in lines 16 and 17. Okay, so so the failure is over there, yes. So if anything, it should have uh, marked, uh, yeah, that, marked that, there, yeah. that, that section. Because, because what failed is not the, uh, the expect equal. That actually w would have worked, by the way. It, it, is, it will return the default value of integer, which is 0. So that, that expectation is actually true. What fails is, uh, uh, sorry, that assertion is actually true. The expectation that the cause would be with the values of one and two, that's the thing that, uh, that failed us. Okay, I'm nearly out of time, but I'm also nearly out of uh, slides, so we're good. Uh, important matches to know. Uh, testing underscore, it's a wildcard. If you don't care what's, uh, what's going to be the parameter, use underscore. Uh, there are a lot of uh, very smart matches you can use. Uh, I'm going to give a few of them. There's a huge list. Uh, you can check if a string contains a regular expression. You can check if a string matches a regular expression. Uh, you can check uh, uh, if a container, if the values in a container are a subset of another container. Uh, you can check uh, if the container have, uh, contains certain elements regardless of order very important in certain tests. Um, you can even do tests that are specific to your class using, uh, I want to test the field of that, uh, of my class uh, to match some, so let's say uh, I have a, a field that is called the name, it's a std string, and I want to make sure that my field uh, uses, uh, matches regular expression, then I can use the field uh, matcher and give it the, uh, first of all, a reference to my field and uh, a matcher to the that will do the actual chess check on the on the response. Same with property. If I want to negate the result, I can do that. Uh, there's also other ways to combine matchers to say if any of uh, the matcher matches, if none of the matcher matches, if this matcher matches on the other matcher, a lot of uh, complexity. Um, and the nice thing is that if you uh, also have uh, if you already enabled Google Mock, then it would be nice if you could use the matchers to not just uh, set the distinguishing calls, but actually also check. Uh, sorry? For sessions. For, for sessions, yes. So you can. It's called uh, expect that. You get a value and a, and a matcher, and it checks that the value matches the matcher. So this is, again, sort of a Swiss army knife. You can do any of the assertions that we mentioned before. Uh, uh, with that, uh, sorry. Yeah. So as a bonus, uh, you can define your own matchers, and you can define your own actions. Uh, matchers are very useful to define. Uh, actions less so because you can always use the Swiss Army knife of the of invoke. Uh, 
Uh, one last thing I want to mention uh, before uh, leaving whatever time we have left for questions is uh, about setting expectations. As we saw, uh, uh, actions on the same expectations must happen in the order they were defined. So if I said uh, in the first test that I uh, will once return six and once returns nine, it has to happen in that order. First it needs to return six and then it needs to return nine. Uh, actions on different expectations by default don't have order defined on them. You can change that, but by default they're all uh, the same. Uh, and there are two ways to define expectations. Google will recommend that you take all of your expectations at the beginning of the test. You just say, this is what I expect to happen in the test, and let it all run and uh, see the results at the end. I'm actually in favor of the other approach, which says, just before you invoke a call that's supposed to cause a, a matching, put the expectations over there. Why is that? Because things will change. And it will be a lot easier to understand the changes if you saw, well, I changed this uh, method. So here's the expectations that related to that, to, that, um, to that method, instead of going to the beginning of every, uh, of every test and start to understand how I need to change the, 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 the system. It also works well with shadowing of expectations, but that's another topic that I'm not going to get into. So in conclusion, first of all, thank you. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them as best as I can. So, either I did a very good job and everybody understood everything, or I did a terrible job and nobody knows what I was talking about for the last 45 minutes. Oh, thank I, I want to ask about your uh, um, experience with uh, Google Test. Uh, you say that you write Google Test on are you using PDD uh, coverage uh, um, of, of your tests, etc. So uh, we are using a coverage, first of all. Uh, we def uh, code will not make it into uh, dev into development bunch without having a 100%. Uh, function coverage. Uh, exceptions for that will need the uh, high uh, management approval. Um, we use it uh, mostly to allow us to, first of all, refactor the code. We, ha we needed to refactor the code several times. And the fact that we can refactor the whole code and says, here's the test that worked last time. They're still working now. We're good. And it actually works is a kind of a small miracle. Uh, we use this for documentation. It's actually very useful to, have, to look at a test and say, OK, this, whoever wrote this code expected it to be used like this. This is what was supposed to happen. Oh, you're supposed to call initialize before you call anything else. I see it on the, in all the tests. Uh, so that's, uh, that's used. And we use it to avoid uh, bugs returning. Every time there is a bug, create a test that, first of all, recreate the bug so you can know that you actually solved it. And since the test remains as part of the code, the bug will never return because every, every time somebody will accidentally merge out your, uh, your fix, the test will start to fail. So, so bugs don't return, or at least not in the exact same uh, way. And uh, what, is, uh, what about PDD? Are you using PDD test-driven driven development? Not, so, um, not formally. It's more uh, up to each developer how do how do they want to uh, to work. Um, some this, uh, some work with you know starting to define a, uh, tests fairly early on in the developing process. Some of them say, well, no. First of all, I want to uh, get to at least the first code review, so I know that at least architecturally, I'm on the right track before I'm starting to invest a lot of time in writing tests. So balance depends on, uh, or depends on uh, each and every developer. Mm -hmm. the I So 
um, it's a it's a it's a bit of matter of uh, preference uh, in a sense. Uh, there is something to be said of, of first of all defining the tests and forcing the test to hold you accountable to not doing anything weird in your code because it's convenient or, or cutting corners. Um, there's something to be said about that. It's also quite difficult in the sense that uh, um, you don't always know what tests you want to make, what are the edge cases that you want to test before you actually wrote the code. So maybe you wrote the code and you said, oh wait, at this point, reallocate, something happens beneath, uh, beneath the, 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 I'm going to have to reallocate, I'm going to have to move things uh, in a certain way. So I, I really need a test for that case. Uh, and you won't necessarily know that until you actually reach the implementation and say, okay, that, that's the case where, where, where this happens and I need to test it. It's actually the responsibility of the reviewer to make sure that there are sufficient uh, tests and, there are, uh, and that they cover what the reviewer, not the developer, what the reviewer thinks should be covered. So there, there are automatic uh, limitations. So you have to get, reach 100% uh, uh, function coverage, for example. Or it simply won't, won't pass. The CI/CD system will block you. But you also have to, of course, do a review. And the reviewer also needs to look. The unit tests are code like any other code. There is no magic distinguish factor that says this is production code, this is, uni uh, this is a unit test code. The reviewer needs to look at both of them and say, okay, the tests are good enough. They're also good enough in terms that they actually check what they want to check. They also need to be good enough in the sense that they're readable, that they compile properly, that they use uh, f uh, uh, you know, code styling and everything else that, ha that need goes into checking that the code is actually the quality that you want it in, in, in your uh, project. So that's the check where we do have. Uh, whether or not you actually do the tests uh, in advance or after or doing or any of that, as I said, there's a bit of philosophy going on here. What, you, what do you prefer? How do you, uh, do you prefer uh, use the tests as contracts and then put it at first? Do you use them as sort of quality checks in, the, in which case use them uh, more at the end? I would say that either case, it doesn't really matter because the value of unit tests is not when you write the code, it's half a, uh, six months later when, something, when you need to change something, you need to uh, fix something, add something, whatever, and then the unit tests that are investment in the future really pays off. Yes? So uh, unit test is basically just uh, just uh, executable. So use whatever uh, uh, whatever tool you use to uh, debug your own executable. Uh, usually uh, the output is very clear and very easy. The, the, while it's been uh, while it's been uh, uh, an executable, it's usually a very simple and easy one to understand. That being said, uh, I personally uh, in favor uh, in favor of Valgrind. Uh, to use. Uh, GDB is also great, uh, but really any, your I know people attach them to their uh, IDEs and use uh, the debugger IDE. Um, everything works because it's just an executable. And it's executable that was compiled on your environment and runs on your environment, so it's the best kind of, se of uh, executable. It doesn't depend on anything that you know remote system happens to have or not have. Yes. Integration with uh, pipeline. Uh, did not try to integrate it with the Shure pipeline. No. Uh, we use uh, GitLab. So we use GitLab pipelines. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Uh, which code covers tools do you use? Or is there any free or open source? Uh, we use GCOV. Uh, it's uh, free open source. Uh, I've made a few changes to it so it will run in parallel because 
usually just runs in uh, um, sequentially, which takes a lot of time, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, Jacob uh, is great. Um, what it requires is to turn on in the compiler a flag that will say that you need to output the symbols that uh, uh, which functions is being called. There's a flag in the in compiler, GCC, and I'm sure in Clang as well, that outputs this file, and then there are a couple of uh, scripts that parse those files and produce a, a very nice HTML report uh, that you can read. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much.